All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer and we will jump right into today's lesson because I don't want to do what I did last week. That was long. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have both the, uh, the opportunity and the privilege of looking at your word, examining the truth and coming out with the understanding of who you are better, not only from today's information we have, but also specifically from the, uh, the aspect of your history. And the fact that we can look at that and examine it according to the evidence, we, we appreciate that very much. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, today's lesson is going to be a little bit different. Um, there's, we're going to go over some details, and next week is going to be more the apologetic of it. So we're going to look at uh, some great amount of information regarding um, the biblical model and but we're not really defending it fully, although I think that the information is very solid. I think you'll you'll understand exactly where I'm going with it very quickly. So this is uh, apologetics lesson number 26. We are winding down the evidentiary apologetic, by the way, and getting to the biblical model. In about two weeks, we'll go into which God, because so far we haven't really established the God of the Bible, although we're using the Bible as our baseline. But we want to make sure that. You know, the God of the Bible is the true and one God, and we have to go ahead and answer the questions of why not that God or this God, the Islamic God, the Hindu God, the Far Eastern gods, Buddha, those types of ideas. Why not those? Are those equal? Are all on the same playing field? So that will start up in a couple of weeks, um, but we want to get through and just finalize these, these concepts of, def of defending the biblical model when it comes down to history. Remember that uh, the apologetics we're dealing with is the Christian apologetic, which means it's the information that enables a believer to provide a defense for why a doctrine is believed. It's not necessarily for evangelism, but it can be used for that. Uh, the, what we're trying to establish here is for those who have questions or have been asked questions and didn't have a good answer, and you want to be able to formulate in your own mind or never be challenged to the point where you doubt or question again. We simply want to give you the information as it is presented, not only within the biblical framework, but also within the observable framework within our world so that you can have a confidence that what we believe about the Bible and what it says is true. Our theme verse is 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account to the, for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And we have attempted to defend the creation account from Genesis 1 and 2, not only from a scriptural standpoint, but also from a scientific one, looking at the scientific evidence, the things that we find in the dirt, the things that we find in history, archaeology, and whatnot. And we find out more and more that evolutionary theory, and we have addressed it head on, and demonstrate that evolutionary is a faulty pseudoscience. It's not only not possible, but also the evidence that we find in nature affirms the biblical creation account. So after addressing evolution, we've begun a series on defending the biblical model, looking at what the Bible says, not from a defensive standpoint, but from an offensive standpoint. Here's what the Bible says, and we have evidence within creation that defends it. We've gone through all the way through the flood and looked at how all of the what we've seen in our world is uh, defendable by what the Bible has said about our history, the pre-flood world as well as within the flood itself and how that explains what we see in the earth today. Canyons and mountains and oceans and rivers and the actual um, seismic activity to the, uh, the weather patterns are all due to a cataclysmic event that happened 4,500 years ago. Now we take our, our continue our defense looking at the biblical model looking specifically at civilizations and languages and how they were created. So we're moving forward after the flood, and we run into a situation that if you follow logically, if, all, if this is where you end, okay, six, eight people went on the ark. They all came off, and that restarted human civilization. What would be your first question about that? Well, number one, why don't we all look the same? I mean, you have family members, right? And if, if you if, if all we started out was with me and Sarah and we had kids and those kids had kids and those kids had kids and kids, don't you think we'd all look pretty much the same? But we were very diverse in how we look. Number two is, why do we all speak different languages? And I'm not talking about between Missouri and Arkansas, <laughs> right? 
you know, you get down to deep Louisiana and they speak a different language. I don't understand what they're talking about. But also you have, of course, within the other, other ethnicities, all the way to European nations, Russian, Hebrew, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, all those, all these languages are very different and diverse. In fact, they keep on finding new languages. Now, we'll talk about that next week more in depth, but how do we explain that? Well, we have the scriptures that give us insight into the historical data of why we are the way we are today as a as a population of humans in acts chapter 17 verse 26 paul was telling on the on the sermon on mount on mars hill he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation so he made from one man. Now you can go back and say from Adam. I go, is that what he's talking about? No, oh, it's Noah. People are like, oh, we're all related to Adam. Yes, we are, but actually closer, we're all related to Noah. Noah had three sons. Those three sons had three daughters, uh, had, had three wives, sorry, and they had children, and that is what repopulated the earth. Where do we find this account? In the book of beginnings. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 10. We're going to read some select passages, and then we're going to kind of evaluate, ask some questions, and kind of see exactly uh, what has been done in research looking at the overall reach of, or the understanding of what we have today in reflection of what we read in Genesis 10. If Genesis is just a fairy tale or Hebrew myth, then we should basically be able to Take Genesis 10 and go, ah, discard it. It's, if it's myth, it should be fairy tale. It should have no bearing upon reality. But here's what it says. Now, these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javon, and Tubal, and Meshesh and Tyrus. And they go, and you go, those names are cool. Means nothing to me. And you'd be right, unless you studied history. Hold on. Skip down to verse six. And you have the sons of Ham, or Cush, Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. <clears throat> okay, those were his sons. Skip down again. And this is going to be a little bit longer. Uh, we're going to look at verses. Uh, down to 21. There we go. I put a little bit too much information on my slides. Starting in verse 21. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. So this is the, the sons of Shem. There's a lot of other details in there that it's we'll get to eventually, but I want to make sure we just kind of get through this passage here. Shem. So I got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We got it over Japheth. We got it over Ham. Here's Shem, the father of the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth. Children were born. And the sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arshabad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hal, Gather, and Mash. Arshabad became the father of Shalah. Shalah became the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almadad and Shaleth. And Hazmareth, and Jarrah, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Amabal, and Sheba. Sheba, huh, that, that's a name we should recognize. And Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. He had a lot of sons. Now their settlement extended from Misha as you go upward to Shafar, the hill country to the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. Out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Now, for obvious people who don't believe the Bible to be literal, people that don't believe the Bible to be uh, trustworthy historically, especially even those 
who believed the Bible to be true in essence, yet in Genesis 1 through 11, again, that's Hebrew myth. That this has nothing to do with the actual world population. But if you actually take a look at these names and you actually trace the world civilizations, you will find these names a consistent understanding of what we understand about world history and civilizations altogether. So, is this actually true? All right. Here's basically what the Bible claims. You have them coming off the ark somewhere around the Middle East. And then you have Japheth kind of going to the north and a little bit towards the east. You have Shem hanging around here, Arabia. Um, then you have Ham going around this location here. Now, obviously, they begin to even increase the more. And we talked about how the earth looks much different immediately after the flood, especially during the Ice Age, which would rapidly have reduced the world's oceans to near uh, rec levels that we wouldn't see. And then we saw all the land bridges that were in existence during that time. So during this post-flood world, they had sons and they began to, to, to bridge out. Now, not all of them, of course. We're not getting to chapter 11 yet, but we know that there was a situation that happened during in the basically fertile crescent. What exactly happened there? Again, that's a little bit more for next week. What we call chapter 10 is the Table of Nations. This section is unique in antiquity. No other historical documents that we could find in ancient history tables out the nations like this. In Genesis chapter 10, I'm going to say this, every word is important. Why do I say that? Because normally when you read the book of Genesis, you get to this and you see my difficulty of reading names. You had the same difficulty and you go, I don't care about these people. They mean nothing to me. And you just go, ah, blah, blah, blah. chapter 11 is much cooler. Let's talk about the Tower of Babel, right? But what you don't realize is amongst those names are your ancestors. Amongst those names are people and lineages that you can follow and go, wait a second, I can, you can probably in some form or another actually get back down to one of the great, great grandsons of Noah and say, that's my great, 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 great <laughs> grandpa. Don't have enough grades memorized. Chapter 10 is broken up into three sections, okay? The three sections are quite obvious, 2 through 5, 6 through 10, 6 to 20. There's another subsection in 15 to 20, uh, and then 21 through 31. All three are not like one's happened and then one happened and one happened. All three are happening contemporaneous, simultaneously. They're all starting to do this at the same time. How do I know? Well, you know, Ham's not going to go, hey, you know what, Sham, you go ahead and have some children first. I'll wait. No, he has his wife and they have their kids and, you know, they have their kids and their kids. And so they're going to be having their children and they're going to be spreading out. And at a point in time, a certain population comes together and tries to build up that Tower of Babel. The details of what we can find, if you actually go through there, and look at not only the sons, but then the grandsons. How many grandsons does Noah have? About 16 grandsons. And from those 16 grandsons of Noah, it expands to 70 base nations. Those names are not just the names of people, but become the names of nations. Okay? This is how the nations is known for that particular person or group. So what happens is this. People read Genesis 10, then they go to Genesis 11 and go, wait a second. If Genesis 11 about the whole world having one language and one kind of ethnicity, one culture, then where in the world does Genesis 10 fit in? Because that's before Genesis 11. Right? If you have all these nations and all these different languages and all these different regions. Um, how does Genesis 11 fit in? 
But what we have to realize is that Genesis 11 is after the events of Genesis chapter 10. This is the Hebraism of the way we talk. Basically, Genesis 10 is an introductory summary to the, to, the, to the concept of nations. Beforehand, before the flood, there were no nations. Everyone, same language, same culture, same everything. Did they separate and have different cities? Did they have wars? Probably. But when you come down to coming off the boat after the flood, everyone speaking the same language. And then Genesis 10 introduces the concept of civilization, nations, and different languages, different cultures. The people reading this, the second generation Israelites, would have recognized every single culture, every single name. Why do I say that? Where have they been? What was the what was the main place that they were coming out of? Egypt. What is Egypt at that time? It is the epicenter of everything. You would have people from all over the world coming to Egypt to do trade. You had every you had people from coming from locations. You'd hear languages and people, and all of a sudden you'd be able to communicate with them and figure out where they're from and see the cultures. Now they go and they go. Oh, I know the puts. We're, we're neighbors. We know the individuals from Japheth. They've come down here to do trade with us. Genesis 10 is how man is divided. They're divided by these different names, these different nations, these different languages, locations. Chapter 11 is why man is divided. Why is man divided? Why aren't they... If we all came off the same boat, why aren't we still just speaking the same language? Genesis 11 answers that question. Genesis 10 describes the different, the, 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 the variety of individuals. And again, remember that those names, especially to these second generation Hebrews, would not only recognize the name as being a child, grandson, great, great grandson of Noah, but also you would recognize them as the name of a nation. I'll demonstrate this. In each section in chapter 10 are about the lines of each son of Noah. Each section is an introduction, body, and conclusion. Very easy to see. What we have here, and if you have my notes, you will see a little table. Sons of Japheth, verse 2. The grandsons, the family lines, the expansion of the nations, verses 3 through 4, and the division of the land, verse 5. Ham, 6, 7 through 19, verse 20. Shem, 21 to 22, 23 to 29, 30 to 31. This is one of the areas that's most intriguing is the division of the land, meaning something happened at that point which caused them to divide. Now, I did not do all this homework. I had lots of friends. They don't know I exist. Well, maybe Arnold does. But all these people here have done extensive research in looking at this data in particular, dealing with it, Genesis chapter 10, and have mapped out in great detail all of the information which I'm about to share with you. And I find it fascinating because, again, the Bible is not just a collection of stories. It is a history book, God's history. And God tells the second generation Israelites coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land something about who they are and where they came from and who are the nations that they're going to encounter. Why? Because Israel is going to become a great nation. And when you become a great nation, what happens? You start interacting with other nations. You have to know who you're dealing with. It's like getting a... World history lesson in one chapter. Current national identities and races are not cut and dry. Why? It's, di it's difficult. Why? In because we marry in, in between places. Do you think that possibly some of the sons of Ham and some of the daughters of Shem may have intermarried? Um, yeah, in fact, we know of one, Abraham, right? Currently, biblically, 
there is only Jew and Gentile. But that's how that's how the Bible divides, right? Now you get some areas, obviously, you talk about different nations, but generally speaking, it's just Jew and Gentile. That's but why? Because it's it's about the Jews, it's about Israel. And so that's how it's presented. However, it must be made clear that we're all one in Christ. It was great. I had a conversation recently with somebody and we were talking and he found out of the past. He goes, oh, I'm a pastor too. Oh, fantastic. And, and he's like, and what do you think about the current race situation going out there? What do you, what's your take on it? And I asked him, I said, there's only one race. What are you talking about? And he, his smile was grand. He loved it because we're not different races. We're all one race, one human race. We're separated by ethnicity at times. We're separated by culture at times. We're separated by language at times because we don't always look like each other, but the division should not be there. It was never intended. The intention of God was to break up these people into different language groups, different cultures. Why? Because when we get all together and we have a global community, we do really bad things. We see that even today. So don't think about this. Don't use this information to go, ah, oh, see, and they should stay over there. That's not what it means. Don't think of this as going us versus them. That's not what it means. This is simply the way that it happened. And we need to understand that the biblical model is true and accurate, reliable information. So first up, we have Gomer. Now, remember, we look at this. You can go ahead and go back to Genesis chapter 10. You can follow along and just look at the different names as we kind of look at them and just Understand that we're we're simply just looking at these names and trying to trace back or try to trace forward from these from Genesis chapter 10 to find out where do they go and who do they have. And it's not just looking at Genesis chapter 10. You would have to go through the entire Bible because a lot of these names are mentioned in, in perpetuity. So Gomer, son of Japheth, Gomer settled in the Galatian Gomerites region and migrated to France, Gaul, Spain. Galatia, migrated also to Wales and settled about various different locations in those northern regions. Generally speaking, if we wanted to trace back much of, for example, my family, I'm probably from that line. Now, you could probably say almost with certainty that the sons of Japheth are pretty much European. Now, we don't know for certain but that is generally the, the concept and idea. You also have Armenia and Germany from, the son, well, from one of the sons of Gomer to Ashkenaz. So Germans, Armenians, still from the sons of, jo of Japheth. Also the son of Japheth, you have Magog. That's, that's a son. We know we recognize that name from what? Prophecy. Okay. Magog moved north to, uh, to Scythia, which is now Romania, and Ukraine. Ah, there you go. You're Magogian. <laughs> yeah, you're on your mom's side. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you say that? Magogian? It's weird. That's fun. And you have Madai. That's a name. These are the Medes. Horsemen settled in India. Do you realize the sons of Japheth went Europe? <laughs> all the way east. In fact, there's a lot more connection between Caucasians and Japanese than there is between Japanese and, and Middle Eastern. Even though there's a distinct look that's different. The sons of Japheth, also you have Javan. This is the Hebrew word for Greece. Kittim. Settled Cyprus, one of the islands. Then you have Tubal. Tubal, which is known as Liberia, which is modern day Georgia. Now, not the state, the country. Just don't, 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 don't mistake Tubal for those who uh, you know like peach pie and speak southern. Then you have Meshesh. This is the ancient name of Moscow. And then Tyrus. His line settled Macedonia and stretched into other portions of Eastern Europe. All sons of Japheth. 
So if I find it very interesting because the, the world wars primarily involved which son? It's all, it's all, it's infighting between the sons of Japheth primarily. Look at this. This is pretty crazy. Think about it. The sons of Japheth, Japan, Germany, East, European, all, they're, they're, it's the same one son of, of Noah creating most of the problem in, in our recent history. That is kind of fun. So, yeah, I would say that pr primarily the people within our Western civilization is from that line of data. We can say that with almost absolute confidence. Now, I'm just giving you information. We really haven't dealt with the apologetics of it. We're going to get, again, into that a little bit more next week. I'm just giving you a lot of information right now. Sons of Ham. First, we have Cush. Cush settled the land of Ethiopia. Now, Nimrod will be discussed in chapter 11. That would be dealing next week, dealing with Nimrod. And I love the fact that he's supposed to be the smartest, greatest man. And now when you call somebody a Nimrod, it's actually a, <laughs> an idiot or someone like that. Mizraim, one of my favorites. Who is Mizraim? Mizraim is Egypt. In fact, if you go back into the Hebrew language and you look up the word Egypt and looking back into these strongs, you would find Mizraim. That's the word. In Hebrew. So I, I it, it confuses people. If you read in the translations, Mizraim, 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 and, and all of a sudden you get to Exodus and it says Egypt, you're going to go, oh, there's no connection. It's the same word. It's just translated different. It drives me crazy, but you know, that's just me. So when you deal with the sons of Ham, right off the bat, you're dealing with people that went to the south. This is why we have that map and it shows the, the Ham going into basically Africa and spreading out in that direction. I also find it very interesting that many of the cultural concepts within South America are borrowed from Africa. I, I that just, it's kind of weird to me. Again, I think I, we made that connection with the land bridge potentially between Africa and South America after the post flood world during the ice age. Then you have put, it's a great name. You know, you have all these great names, Mizraim, Canaan. What's this one called? Put. <laughs> this is the Hebrew name for Libya. It's another Northern African place. And of course, Canaan. Canaan gets special attention in 15 and 19. One reason I didn't read it. Um, and he primarily settled, which is the land of Israel. And this is the land in which Israel conquered the land of Canaan. And from Canaan, you have a whole mess of people, right? So that land of Canaan to get special attention because of Ham's particular sin and, you know, the, the, looking at his whatever happened there. And then it's funny because Noah doesn't curse Ham and all of his children. He only curses one son, uh, one grandson, and that's Canaan. Cursed be the land of Canaan. And now you cannot find a Canaanite. Soon after Israel conquered that land, Canaanites are gone. Now, they were still around for a little while. You still have a few different individuals who are probably there. But you have a lot. From Canaan, you have the nations of the Philistines, the Hittites, and the Jebusites. In Judges chapter 19, verse 10, you have a, a lot of details about that particular connection to the Canaanites. Other nations came from Canaan. You can read that in verses 10 through 18. These people groups also became the nations of Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot was, was not a cousin of his in regard to the fact that he was from the, the, the same line of Shem, but actually Abraham was a Shemite from the line of Shem. Sodom and Gomorrah was from the line of Ham. When God comes down to deliver Israel out of the land of Mizraim, God promises that he will give the land of the descendants of Canaan to Israel. All of these people are recorded in the nations that God deals with or directly, or Israel encounters them as they walk through these lands, especially the Canaanites, the sons of Canaan, the sons of Ham. Almost all of these nations, Mizraim and Canaan specifically, He's dealing with the sons of Ham. I find that, again, fascinating as the Shemites begin to take over what was now going to be their promised land. 
Today, Northern Africa is not Ham. It's not from the sons of Ham. Egypt, Libya are not traditionally from those locations. Why? Well, because around 330 BC, you had non-Hamatic tribes, non-tribes that are not from Ham, take over those locations. Traditionally, the descendants of Ham are believed to be African nations, as well as some mingling with other nations due to conquering and migration. Now, what's important to understand is that Israel, again, is becoming familiar with the nations that they are dealing with. Who are they really? It's not grounds for race differentiations. Genetics have shown that all the races have some connections. Even if you're predominantly X, Y, Z, not genome, <laughs> A, B, C, let's do it that way. Even if you're predominantly A, B, or C, you will have some other form of genetic code within you from other different lineages. So we may be predominantly, or I, let's go ahead and talk for myself. I may be predominantly from the line of Japheth, but it doesn't mean that I don't have some Shemite or Ham in me as well. Okay? Keep that in mind. So there's no, I, I, it drives me crazy because when people start getting really race in, entwined and they think that they're 100% this, and then they take a 23 and me, and people get devastated. Of course, our, our favorite one was Elizabeth Warren, right? That's just hilarious. She actually revealed it online, live. Maybe you should have looked at that before <laughs> you revealed that. What's important to understand again is that we don't treat each other in some form of separation due to Genesis 10. There is nothing in there about any prescribed data to take this information and to make sure that you don't mingle. There's only one instruction in scripture where it says not to mingle, and that is Israel as they're going into the land of Canaan. But it's not because of genetic purity. It's because the Canaanites were heavy idolatry, immoral, and violent. And if you begin to intermarry with that culture, it devastates the culture that God was establishing within Israel. Obviously, when you had the sons of Jacob, um, he only had one daughter. Who were they marrying? They're probably marrying Canaanites. Now, they may have gone north. Also, Abraham had one of his offspring from Egypt. It's not about keeping a purity of race or genetics. It is about keeping the culture established and not allowing idolatry to intermingle into the family. So just keep that in mind. I want to make sure that becomes very clear. In fact, um, when you get down to it, sorry, I, I skipped a whole bunch. I said a whole bunch of this, so I'm just going to get through the slides real quick. Again, the information is not about basis of races or discrimination. There is no, here's a, here's a quote from somebody. There is no truth to the idea that any of the sons of Noah is to be identified with a particular race of humanity. You can't look at a black man and go, hey, he's from the tribe of Ham. Not necessarily. In fact, here are some twins. I love twins because sometimes the genetic code goes absolutely insane. These are pictures of twins. That's right. <laughs> How did they get our baby pictures? <laughs> These are twins. So, how, how is this possible? Well, when you do have within ourselves, we have the potential for genetic codes that are sometimes not always directly reflective of what the parents look like. And sometimes it's a little bit a mix of both. I find that very refreshing. I find that amazing because the way our pigment is does not depict anything other than simply artist canvas. 
Don't let it happen. And this goes against, by the way, much of the evolutionary theory. The main evolutionary theory, if you read Darwin and you read other people by that, what do they theorize? Why did the uh, the Armenian uh, the, the sorry the um, the Aryan race think that they were the most developed? Do you know by the way that there was an argument during World War II about who was the most evolutionary and developed? It was between the Japanese and the Ar and the Aryan race. Japanese, yeah. Why? You know why? No hair. They they were they, they had a lot less hair than the Italians. So the, oh, we're we're farthest from the gorilla. The evolutionary primary theory was that each main race developed independently from one another. That humans were not all connected. Rather, they sprung up and over there in, in Europe, and then they swung up over here in China, and then over here in Africa. And therefore, you had them all come up differently. The biblical model says no. And guess what they did recently? They mapped the human genome from all various different places and races. And guess what they found out? They go, hmm, it appears that every single person came from about a population of eight. And we go, really? I never would have guessed that. It's so silly at times. Now, again, that's more information for next week. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of blew the surprise on that one. Elam, sons of Shem. Let's talk about Elam. Elam is the ancient name for Persia. Daniel. Okay. It was changed to Iran later. Again, you got that from Acts chapter 2, verse 9, where we're getting the ideas of the word Elam is still being used in the Greek New Testament. It's not called, it's not called Iran. It's called Elam. And it got changed later on. You'll also have Asher, which is the Hebrew word for Assyria. Now, you recognize some of these other names, and when we're going through them, you go, oh, I recognize that name, I recognize that name. It's just the, we're talking about the ancient names. And where do we find these ancient names? Genesis 10. Um, okay. Arfashad, I'll just say it like that. The father of the Chaldeans, Eber. Eber is where we get the word Hebrew. He, Eber had two sons, Peleg and Joktan. Those are important names. Because these are the times in which the world was divided. Again, that'll be discussed a little bit further next week. You got, huh, I missed a slide. Okay, you also have Lud and Aram. Lud is the father of the Lydians, the capital of Sardis, referred to in Revelation 3. Aram, the word for Syria, and they spoke Aramaic. The connection is, 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 is wild. And people read Genesis 10 and see no connection. Why? Because you're not reading in the Hebrew. And you're not making the connection between modern day nations. All these nations, all of them can be traced back to Genesis chapter 10. But now, what about the languages? You can ask yourself a question. What is the evolutionary thought about language? You ever watch, like, one of my favorite movies growing up was um, uh, The Quest for Fire, you know, you know, you know 15,000 B.C., and all the people are going, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm going, and it, it's funny because you're watching, because, you know, kids like cavemen, you know, and they're trying to find fire, and they're all acting like monkeys, and it's hilarious. But what's the, what's the main predominant thing? They don't speak anything. They, they're, they're communicating in grunts and points. Has that ever been the way the human population has ever communicated? No. In fact, language was one of the baseline concepts. God said. He didn't go, Adam, be fruitful, multiply. And Adam go, ooh. <laughs> they communicated immediately. God gifted them language. Evolutionary theory behind language doesn't make, even make sense especially when you consider the fact of all the different languages we have today. We'll talk about that. You know, again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We'll talk about that next week. Let's go ahead and pray. And hopefully you found this kind of inform informative and it will get into the more of the proof of these in of this information as we move forward. Let's pray. 
God, heaven, thank you so much. Your word is true, and we are just trying to keep up. We thank you that we are a privilege to read information such as Genesis 10 and not just read over it and just, ah, uh, it's Hebrew stuff or it's not really important to us, but realize the connection we have with each other through this table of nations, understanding that we are all related through Noah and his sons. A truly remarkable act that you've done for us, not only giving us this life and this world to live in, but also to be able to trace back our history so that we can understand exactly who you are and who we are in you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.